welcome and uh, also thanks to thanks to everyone um, our students in the program and uh, members of the of the public for um, for staying with us um, uh, with the postponement of this event uh, from last week really appreciate it appreciate your staying with us um, welcome this is the uh, this is the uh, second event in the semesters um, in this spring semesters uh, public events for the MA curatorial practice program uh, at the School of Visual Arts in New York um, my name is Brian Kwan Wood I'm the director of uh, research in the program and on behalf of myself and the chair Stephen Henry Madoff uh, I'd like to welcome you all here today um, it's a, a real honor to be joined uh, by by uh, two Natashas, <laughs> by Natasha Jinwala and Natasha Sadr Hagigian, uh, both um, both based in Berlin. I think um, Natasha Jinwala is now in Colombo, uh, in 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 Sri Lanka, uh, and so it was really it's really nice that we could make this work uh, between all of the the, the crazy uh, time differences. And what we are talking about today. And what we're what we'll hear from them about uh, sort of revolves around um, an exhibition and a book on riots uh, that that Natasha Jinwala uh, uh, has did in the past few years, and um, it was first I think it began with an exhibition entitled "Riots: Slow Cancellation of the Future," which chronicles an international history of uprisings. And then was later elaborated in uh, Knights of the Dispossessed, Riots Unbound, which uh, was a book recently published by Columbia, by Columbia Books on Architecture and the City, and which Natasha uh, uh, co-edited uh, together with uh, Gal Kern and Nilofar Tajari. Um, and it's also a real pleasure to have with us Natasha Sadr Hagigian, who is an artist who has traced the history and application of police militarization and racial profiling tactics. And I think what is really interesting, I think, about um, about this side of of, of Natasha Sadr Hagigian's um, uh, artistic practice and uh, Natasha Jinwala's uh, book and exhibition is uh, is a certain kind of uh, phenomenological and, and sensory uh, approach to, um, to 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 political uh, to political uprisings and um, uh, and and, um, and and questions of power, right? So where 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 do these questions manifest in the sense in the sensory domain? But then where does the sensory domain also open up avenues? Uh, where one can also intervene into extremely, extremely large uh, um, structures of power that seem otherwise um, inaccessible to us. Uh, so it, I, I think um, with that, I, I'll simply pass the, uh, the proverbial microphone uh, to Natasha Jinwala. Thanks so much um, for this invitation, Brian. Um, and I am um, excited to continue the uh, relationship with the um, MA curatorial practice at SVA. It's been great to also be in touch with students previously uh, mentoring, um, and of course to share this uh, anthology with you, uh, which is a collective work uh, as Brian said, it's been uh, co-edited with Gal Kirn, um, who is a political philosopher, thinker, and Nilofar Tajeri, who is um, an urban theorist uh, with a background in architecture and also an activist. Um, they're both based in Berlin. And um, there's so much that uh, is, is complex about this subject of the riot, um, starting with also the the trouble with definitions. Um, so, um, Michelangelo, uh, if we stay at the just at the first uh, slide, um, I I want to just give you a little bit more backdrop before I sort of go go, go into the subject because uh, just to say that 
this is uh, a book uh, with over 20 voices from different parts of the world. And of course, the, the history of riots and rioting goes back centuries. So the question, of course, would be, you know, where does one start and end as such? Uh, there is there is no end. Um, if we go by Joshua Clover, then we are in an age of riots. Um, but we did uh, in, say, let's say, primarily, uh, we did go with having um, texts uh, on one hand that dealt with the trouble of definitions. So really looking at uh, political uh, theorists, uh, activists, uh, philosophers, really thinking about where the riot begins and ends, um, also thinking about the notion of the rioter um, and the terminologies that uh, swim in, in this uh, space of the rioter, the mob, uh, and, um, uh, and all of the other sorts of negative uh, tones and characteristics that accompany uh, this, uh, the spatial logic of, of the riot, as well as uh, the scars uh, that it leaves in the social fabric. Uh, so a lot of it is also about the aftermath of riots, um, because that again is a space of trauma, is a space of silencing and, uh, a, a space of dispossession in a in a in an enduring sense. So just these are just uh, some elements uh, to share with you. Also, as um, today happens to be uh, the the birth date of uh, Toni Morrison, um, I wanted to to read uh, from part of. So I'm just going to to sort of move through the book as we go through uh, parts of the presentation. Um, there's a segment of introduction um, in in the book that that I uh, I wrote uh, and it starts with this quote. Uh, what struck me most about those who rioted was how long they waited, the restraint they showed, not the spontaneity, the restraint. They waited and waited for justice, and it didn't come. No one talks about that. And these are words by Toni Morrison around the Los Angeles riots of 1992. Morrison points to how superficial explorations of riots see them in terms of speed, defiance, a loss of sensibility, a tipping point, and a muddy event horizon that blurs facticity. Visceral stuff brims over with burning and looting if we go by the words of Bob Marley and the Whalers from their 1973 album. But when we see the cumulative patterns of riots, we have to ask anew, where did they begin? What has changed in the system as the cycle of waiting, systemic injustice and rage repeats itself? Um, also an important element of, of this book um, has been to look at um, the, the very, again, the very, very uh, complex terrain of riots and pogroms and uprisings, because I also find that in introductions, um, you know, we, we kind of lean towards sometimes the, the term uprising because it, it sort of has more an affirmative sort of uh, presence. And, and, and then, um, you know, riots recently, what are called riots um, is also kind of questionable behavior from the alt-right, from right-wing um, uh, campaigns and, and, and protests of uh, also of uh, privileged um, uh, upper class uh, actors. So it's there's there's many, many elements here to unpack. Um, the pogrom again has a very long history. Uh, and and it is one that we must also very diligently uh, watch over because there are those who have endured um, this extreme violence who insist on that term pogrom applied to their particular experience of, of violence. And so I just I just wanted to just to put that out there because we will look at further examples from the book um, that that uh, particularly reveal uh, such examples. Also, um, now we're going to go to the to the next slide and and just listen for a moment.
spreading like lightning. It's just fight, 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 spreading like lightning. Who pay your hurning to set crystal burning? Who pay your hurning? Michelangelo. Thank you. Um, so this this is a part of a mix that was created by uh, artist filmmaker Louis Henderson. It's a it's a mix of Bristol sound, um, and uh, this is an excerpt. We're also going to be uh, having on um, art review a special podcast um, by uh, Louis, uh, which will have another mix uh, version of uh, by Louis. Um, and this work is, I think it was one of the commission projects we did and the exhibition I want to mention, uh, I worked on very closely with Christina Hunya, uh, who also was crucial for the publication. And when we started together to speak to Louis about this project, um, he was really looking at the landscape of riots in Britain. Um, and, uh, connecting the history of uh, riots from the 80s um, with the the appearance of uh, SAS laws, um, Thatcher's regime that began in 1979. Um, the image that you saw included uh, Linton Kwesi Johnson, who is um, a dub poet, Rastafarian, and he wrote uh, um, or he he recited Sonny's letter and composed it also in the year 1979. Um, so it's also this moment in which policing takes on a ruthless turn, um, which is viscerally attacking also younger members, younger black members of the community. The Caribbean population, particularly in the case of Bristol, was heavily under attack um, during the time of Thatcher. And so um, what's what's really um, uh, critical about what, what Louis does here, um, he looks to the work of uh, people like uh, John Acomfra, and, and, and the kind of filmmaking that uh, Acomfra did uh, with uh, the Black Audio Film Collective, with Hansworth songs, but also in this case, really also uh, remarking on uh, the place of sound as central. Uh, so uh, the fact that Bristol Sound and uh, St. Paul's in particular that had riots or you can say uprising as per what the community members prefer in 1980, that is before other riots that took place in rapid succession in the UK. So it, it remains one that is not necessarily interrogated um, as such uh, to, the, to the degree that other riots in the UK are in the 80s. And so in this case, um, the, the relevance of sound, uh, in a sense, is also taking predominance over the image. And there's a sort of montage-like sequencing that is carried out in relationship to uh, thinking about the mixing deck of uh, the sound system and the sound system coming in from Jamaica to, uh, to the neighborhoods in Bristol and the role of it, in a sense, um, the way that sirens, uh, they, they they are converted from the police sirens into the sirens uh, that are used on um, for, for carnivals and for the sort of sonic um, um, rebellions uh, that take place on those same streets in the aftermath of riots as well. So this is just a very, you know, it's very rapid what I'm doing here, but um, I just, I really feel that uh, while we have this, this thick anthology with several, uh, texts, um, the sonic bleeds, uh, the noise um, of riots is something that recurs as this haunting and as this sort of ghost image, uh, which is which is extremely interesting. And perhaps, you know, that's something we can also take up uh, together in, in the questions. Um, and I go go here to also uh, Martin Luther King, for instance, saying um, a riot is the language of the unheard. But then at the same time, um, when we look at look at poetry, for instance, again, where you sort of reading here, uh, Riot Act, which again was uh, Ayogaba's poem uh, from 1992, also reflecting on the experience in Los Angeles, um, where 
where she turns it around and also looks at uh, the nature of disrupting capitalism and the timeline, the temporality of capitalism and neoliberal consumerism uh, through uh, acts of rioting. So um, yeah, I won't read, read this out, but I mean, you've been looking at it. Uh, so this again has a certain rhythm to it, right? It could easily be a song. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really particularly interested uh, in the notion of poesis and uh, and and sonic cultures that that foreground uh, that space that horizon um, of of the riot as something that endures as something that haunts. Okay. Um, yeah, we're not we're not going to go too much into detail, but just to share, this is another contribution which came from a, a conversation with Vaginal Davis who some of you may know of. Um, and again, Vaginal Davis is, is such a loved figure and um, there's so many so many different things you can talk to her about, whether it's cinema or, or music um, and, and her life in LA, which again, um, meant being prone to uh, acts of rioting and whether that's the Wat Watts Rebellion, um, you know, so really uh, also observing how America changed through the many race riots that it experienced um, and cultural figures, you know, so um, uh, she she talks about, uh, you know, people, people like uh, Miles Davis, you know, she talks about several cultural figures, uh, Black cultural figures and protagonists who experienced uh, race riots uh, in their lifetime, um, and what it did to them, what it what it fundamentally uh, altered uh, within within them, and and that includes Josephine Baker, um, uh, thinking about the 1917 uh, Saint Louis um, race riots. Okay. Yeah. This is um, another brilliant contribution. Maybe first we listen. Came back today. Jefferson, Washington, and Lincoln. And Walter Cronkite put them on channel two to find out what they were thinking. I'm sure they'd say thanks for quoting us so much. But we don't want to take a bow Enough with the quoting Put those words into action And we mean action now Um, it's hard, it's hard not to like want to listen to the whole song, but um, yeah, this is, it's, this is really a powerful anthem um, by Lena Horn. Um, and what's, what's special about it, which you don't see here, um, is, is the fact that Josh Kuhn in his essay, The Time is Still Always Now, um, has written about this very special uh, film. Uh, which was made by um, the the Cuban um, uh, revolutionary filmmaker uh, Santiago Alvarez, and Alvarez was given this uh, record uh, by Elena Horn uh, in 1965 by Robert F. Williams, who was a civil rights leader and black radical writer who was in exile in Havana. It's a it's a long story, um, but uh, what we know um, about this exchange and encounter is that this brilliant film came out of it, which is also, as Josh puts it, uh, almost a kind of music video. Um, it's this brilliant uh, montage sequence of newsreel footage um, that brings together uh, moving images of police beatings of African Americans. I'm quoting him: the 1965 Watts Rebellion, street protests, the KKK, Nazi Germany, a meeting between Martin Luther King Jr. and President Lyndon Lynn Johnson, an edited beheading and reheading of the Lincoln Memorial, and a collage of portraits of Horn herself singing this very powerful song in which she is also taking on the stage in order to uh, to to address uh, racism and and systemic uh, violence 
And so this is also done uh, way back. And, and these are the images that one sees Wrecker uh, also in the current times. Uh, and so how to therefore look at these moments as, as unfinished circuits? Um, uh, yeah, um, just swiftly going forward. This is now I'm kind of changing, uh, changing uh, to another part of the book, also just to reveal to you that, I mean, obviously we've gone through a lot of uh, content from North America, but uh, for me personally, it was extremely important to uh, look at riots in an inseparable dimension as well to the global south as, as we may call it uh, or choose to call it. Um, this is, for instance, the case of Sri Lanka that has been um, uh, researched deeply uh, by artist and activist Chandragupta Tenuvara, who looks at the 1983 Black July riots um, and these as preceding the decades uh, long uh, civil war and uh, ethnic violence. Uh, and the, so the different chapters also of building an enemy image um, and of systemically targeting a minority group uh, in the island and what it means to actually have the riot as a sequence uh, or a decisive chapter in a longer sequence. Um, and what it means to commemorate, that's again, something that's very, very special to his practice. The act of commemoration, uh, again, as an unfinished circuit. Uh, Gauri Gill uh, is another uh, brilliant artist uh, who we, we've worked with um, closely in the book uh, because this project of hers um, is, is something that translates uh, into the book form and as well as uh, the, as well as the exhibition, um, in a sense, the also Natasha's project, I think very interestingly translates into the book form. So for Gauri, the notebook, um, which is 1984, also the name of the project, is one instrument in way in in which the this project actually travels that um, talks about the anti Sikh pogroms of 1984 in India. And as some of you may have heard, the fact is uh, the the kind of injustice uh, that was uh, pursued in 1984 um, in Delhi uh, against the Sikh community, uh, but also resonating then in other parts of India, uh, is something that has has been called out uh, for for several years after. Uh, but there's still, um, of course, uh, the the question of justice uh, is is still still in the shadows. There are still uh, memorials, there are still uh, reports that that do not necessarily um, bring all actors into account because many of these were political actors. Many of them were uh, members of the police forces, of course, uh, and of the majority, majoritarian groups. Um, so the way that Gauri deals with the photographic image is, is really, really, um, I think, uh, singular in a sense. She uh, went out into the streets um, and specific neighborhoods uh, such as Trilokpuri, um, Tilak Vihar and Gari, um, and where there were um, those survivors of, of, the, of the pogrom, um, those who are widows uh, from the pogrom, children who grew up uh, hearing stories and have been traumatized by this particular episode. And um, she took photographs that had circulated in the early 2000s um, within mainstream media. Um, but then also what she did was here you see, she has asked Arundhati Roy, several other uh, members of the artist community uh, around her, um, including uh, Shuddha Brata of Rakas Media Collective, various others to write, um, based on their interpretations and readings of these photographs, um, but also um, of their memory of this time in Delhi. Uh, and it's, it's, it's extremely, again, evocative. It's, it's a way of witnessing or traveling back uh, to that moment because this was done in 2013 and uh, the, the program was 1984. So, there's, there's also, um, this is a very expansive project because there's also a bibliography that Gauri is constantly um, collecting, revising, annotating, um, which travels along. So there's multiple ways in which this memory is accessed uh, and literature becomes also a field of, of further, further access and debate. 
Um, okay. Um, I, I won't talk about this in, in great detail, just to say this is a really important uh, group of artists, um, activists uh, in India uh, uh, under, uh, under Sehmat. Um, they started in uh, 1989 after the brutal uh, murder of uh, a theater activist, um, Safdar Hashmi. And artists have been part of this, uh, this sort of alliance, part of this movement uh, to preserve a secular spirit uh, and artistic freedom in India uh, through various uh, platforms creating, um, you know, looking at music, looking at um, protests, looking at exhibitions that again demarcate uh, the way that riots, uh, say the riots in Bombay that you see here from 1992 go, go into the riots in Gujarat. And what are the motifs that recur in that violence? Um, this is a contribution by Ala Yunus. Um, again, we were really looking at how parts of the exhibition could also translate into the book form. The book cover is also from Ala um, and she addresses the food riots in Egypt in the 1970s and how the food riots in Egypt are um, also situated within the history of cinema. Um, and at the same time, what role they have to play uh, in further history of uprising uh, in, um, in Egypt. This is uh, another, this is actually an image from the exhibition uh, with the project of the Karabing Film Collective and an essay by Elizabeth Povanelli, uh, who chooses with, with Karabing to um, identify very different uh, causes uh, for the riot um, uh, in a very, very intimate sense also, what it means for an Aboriginal community dealing with settler violence and settler laws and policing. Um, what, what, ki what actually um, uh, is the trigger for, for a riot within the community, okay? We can go next. I think we're we're gonna yep, and that's on cue for Natasha. Um, yeah, it, this has been a really special collaboration. It's now been a couple of years that we've 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 had back and forth uh, on this project, Natasha. So it, it's really it's really nice to actually be in conversation now that it feels like it's really come full circle. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Natasha, for um, presenting uh, the anthology. Um, and and yeah, it's it's wonderful hearing you speak about it, and also for giving me the cues to um, to take over from from where you left it. Um, the debate on on terminology that Natasha that you mentioned, um, I think um, I found is 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 an expression of um of a larger question and and i guess um i would maybe just um preliminarily um frame it as a question of the monopoly of uh, of, uh, of, of violence so who has this monopoly and um and i've been um yeah this question has been following me um for um for a number of years uh, maybe um more kind of focusing on the military industrial complex and it's uh, continuities in the project trail that I did in Documenta 13 um, and then from there kind of um, shifting towards uh, questions of, of structural racism and institutional racism that then led to um, the People's Tribunal uh, unraveling the NSU complex and from there also the collaboration with forensic architecture on the killing of Halid Yozgad and um, and and the question of violence um, is, of course, um, the very kind of crucial question of Fanon um, and um, and also James Baldwin. And it's 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 crucial also in the sense that um, uh, it's um, it's a fundamental part of of struggle, whether it be anti-colonial, feminist, uh, black struggle, um, and and we know it also as a struggle in confrontation with the state more recently um also uh you know uh in direct confrontation um uh with uh for example right-wing groups uh um or fascist groups which is again uh, it it has a continuity because um these 
direct confrontations, of course, have their own history. But um, what I thought, um, or what, what always helps me looking at the term violence is actually the German term Gewalt, uh, which um, when you look at translations of Walter Benjamin, um, you always find um, this kind of glitch um, when, you know, in, in his um, Critique der Gewalt, Critique of Violence, um, the German term Gewalt actually means not only violence, it also at the same time means power and it means force. And I think the, the kind of three definitions of, of Gewalt kind of show um, kind of the, the landscape of what is at stake when we talk about the monopoly of violence. Um, usually this, um, uh, yeah, the sonic uh, sphere of struggle uh, is one that, that I'm always very drawn to and interested in. But in, in this project, Fuel to the Fire, um, I guess I focused more on, on the visual aspects um, of struggle. And here in particular, um, it's the question also of policing um, and, and uh, yeah, the structural violence uh, or organized violence, as James Baldwin would say, that um, is embedded in the history of policing. And um, Fuel to the Fire um, started, uh, it's, it's a project that I sh first um, showed in, in Stockholm in Tensta Kunsthal. And it started from a case uh, of a, a police um, uh, murdering um, a resident of, uh, of a northern suburb of, of uh, Stockholm. Uh, Stockholm, a city that is um, uh, very segregated and the northern suburbs uh, specifically are um, inhabited by people who um, are seen as, you know, um, a migrant or formerly migrant population. Um, and there's a, a very kind of long history of, of confrontation with, with police. Um, so with this, this case that happened in 2013, it led to a substantial uh, uprising which was called first the Stockholm riots, but then again, you know, the terminology is also um, under debate uh, to call it rebellion or uprising. And um, it was uh, triggered by um, the local SWAT police called Piketen uh, killing um, a retired man, uh, his name is Lenin Delvas Martins, in his own home um, because he was flashing a knife on his balcony and they went in and, and killed him. And, and in the aftermath, um, there was a local youth group uh, called Megafon that challenged the, the police uh, narrative and, and show, you know, uh, with, with um, eyewitness images, uh, proved that the police was actually lying in their report and that they had in fact killed him and not taken him to the hospital um, as they claimed. And that uh, legitimacy crisis uh, for the police um, was, uh, you know, was responded to with, uh, you know, changing the report, but not ha had had no other effects. And um, and when I looked at the media coverage, um, there was very very little news about this killing uh, that happened in uh, in Husby. And this, of course, is part of a larger picture of of you know police violence uh, staying unaccounted for um and and you know to no surprise a few days after this youth group had tried to you know with a demonstration with publishing texts you know with uh, different forms of protest to um bring attention to um to this uh, case um but unheard um the, a few days later um cars were burning and um and and the suburbs exploded. Um, one thing that um, that I guess was was very important in this, um, and I'm just gonna show you um, a few pages of the newspaper that that we did. Um, here you see, um, you know, the the, um, the things that this youth group Megaphone uh, published on their website. And uh, here you see the, the image of, um, that, that neighbors took of Lenin Relvas Martins being carry, carried out of his house. 
Um, the question of violence here um, was then, as you know, is often the case, narrated in the media uh, through, um, you know, covering uh, the images of uh, burning cars and having and establishing this narrative of of uh, senseless violence, of um, a troubled youth that um, failed to integrate into society, and um, and that cannot articulate itself. And something that I think Natasha also um, outlined quite uh, beautifully is that this um, seemingly unarticulated language is actually the language of the unheard. And that's something that I think also um, was a kind of a threat that led to the, through the project. Um, I'm going to show you a few uh, images from um, from the project. So here again, you see uh, the eyewitness image of when um, Lenin Drevas Martins was taken out of the apartment um, after he was shot and killed. Um, and he's wrapped in a red blanket with a, with a white heart on it. Um, while the police had um, actually claimed that they had brought him to, to a hospital um, and that he was just injured. What this image, um, you know, when I first saw it, what it triggered were two questions. And these were the questions that kind of uh, guided the, the project. Uh, the first one was, uh, what on earth um, does a SWAT team do in the apartment of a retired uh, person? And the second one was, um, uh, what is the role of eyewitness images um, in these cases of a legitimacy crisis for policing. And um, I wrote a, a short text and I thought maybe I just read a little excerpt uh, from it. Um, it's the editorial of the newspaper that, um, uh, that we published in, in, as part of the project. So two questions preoccupied me when I first saw the image of Lenin Delvas Martin's dead body being carried out of his home in Husby on the night of May 13, 2013. Martins had been shot by Piketon SWAT police in his own apartment, a fact they first denied. The incident later led to a significant uprising in Sweden. The qu first question was, why on earth is a SWAT team dispatched to the home of a retired man who waves a knife on his balcony? How, when and why did the police start to operate this way? Tracing the history of SWAT police leads me to Los Angeles in the 1960s, and I find more police violence and more uprisings. The first special weapons and tactics team was formed in the aftermath of the Watts Rebellion in 1965, which was sparked by police harassment in the segregated and impoverished neighborhood of Los Angeles. After their first deployment in an attack on the headquarters of the Black Panther Party, for self-defense Los Angeles chapter in 1969, SWAT immediately captured the hearts of police chiefs all over the United States and eventually the world. Its success story ties into what Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Craig Gilmore describe as a political culture of perpetual enemies who must always be fought but can never be vanquished. This political culture of perpetual crisis and war is deeply embedded in the racist colonial project and was vividly enhanced by the 9-11 Commission in the War on Terror to create what Tony Negri called the warfare state. Looking into the history of policing also means looking at perpetual resistance, absurd rebellion and self-defense by the communities that are exposed to the power of police and it's violently dispensed warnings to stay the fuck where you are and obey, or as Tony Platt would put it, to contain exclusion and abandonment. And this leads to the second question, which concerns the image itself. Neighbors had held out until 6, uh, 3, 3 a.m. to take a picture that would provide visual evidence of not only police killing Lenin, but also lying about it. The neighbors knew that nobody would believe them over the police report 
and that an image would be more powerful than their verbal accounts. How did visual evidence of police violence become the most important tool in creating a legitimacy crisis for law enforcement? Indeed, court witness accounts are increasingly only deemed viable when supported by data or material evidence, a shift Tom Keenan describes as a forensic term. This term, as Keenan also points out, leads to a whole new genre of reading and interpreting visual evidence. The growing number of images taken by more and more neighbors have another agency outside of courts and corporate media. They proliferate along social networks and feeds, reposts and shares, multiplying witnesses. They expand the act of witnessing beyond the courtrooms and investigating investigation committees, beyond the limits of segregated neighborhoods, beyond racial frontiers and beyond capitalist visual regimes that seek to monopolize and control what is seen and is to be seen. By looking at these images, we all participate in the act of witnessing and their requests. We can study with and learn from the battleground that these images create, a battleground of interpretations and legitimacies of different visual regimes, of differently coded ways of seeing, and ultimately a battleground of technologies and access. Mobile phone against the police body camera and drones. Despite the image and its impact, no one was held accountable for the murder of Lenin Delvas Martins or for lying about it. An internal, an internal police investigation justified the actions of the police and deemed them appropriate. As the activist group Megaphone had stated on their website already the day after the killing, this is neither the first nor the last time. This is a system. The police are not there to serve the common people. The police are in our areas to protect the political and economic elites, to scare us, to discipline us." End quote. A statement uncannily similar in its systemic analysis to James Baldwin's writing in the 1966 report from Occupied Territory. Quote, the police are simply the hired enemies of this population. They are present to keep us in, in our place and to protect white business interests, and they have no other function. They are, moreover, even in a country which makes the very grave error of equating ignorance with simplicity, quite stunningly ignorant. And since they know that they are hated, they are always afraid. One cannot possibly arrive at a more true fire formula for cruelty. How does this impact the legitimacy of organized violence that policing is hinged on? And what does it mean for the legitimacy of police in general? So that, um, that was a quote um, or like an excerpt of, of, the, um, um, of this editorial uh, for, for the newspaper. Um, and I'm just quickly going to take you to, through a couple of slides. Um, I guess, um, you know, the question of where to start and where to end for me in this project um, led me to two moments uh, in the in the question of the eyewitness image, it led me to Rodney King and the 1992 um, Los Angeles uprisings. And in the, in the question of SWAT policing, it led me to the Watts Rebellion and to the beginning of SWAT policing in the LAPD. Um, so I'm just going to show you a couple of images of the installation in Stockholm. Um, there were two major elements in, in this installation. Uh, one was um, the patio heater, and the other one was the red blanket. And the red blanket, you might remember, is 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 something that I took from um, from the image of uh, of Lenin Relvas Martins uh, um, being carried out of his his home. Um, it is both of these objects are part of a, of a space that is, uh, you know, oftentimes outside of restaurants, and it's a space that is. Uh, is a as a privatized uh, public space so it's it's you you can only be in that space when you're a customer um and so they they're kind of everyday objects of of creating kind of uh, boundaries of 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 spaces in in the public um in the exhibition 
um, they take different uh, forms. This is when you enter the exhibition and the patio heaters basically hold uh, newspaper clip clippings of the media coverage of the Stockholm riots uh, in the place where, you know, where the, the heater uh, would, would usually be, um, yeah, be, be giving out heat. Uh, you have the newspaper clippings of burning cars and you kind of enter the space through that through that uh, imagery and that imagery is is then kind of unpacked into other narratives um, and and um, you you then um, see um, uh, the the kind of front of, of a balcony which is the balcony uh, that is used in the, the northern suburbs uh, it's it's the uh, you know, it's called the million program and they in the 50s, they built a, a million housing units. And this is the kind of iconic balcony that Lenin Revas Martins was standing on um, when he was flashing his knife. And it shows then also uh, a red blanket that replaces the, the kind of the, um, the floor of, of, of this balcony. Then um, there is a series of prints on these red fleece blankets. Um, the first one you might recognize from from the photograph. This is, um, you know, from the the eyewitness accounts of uh, of the case in Stockholm with Lenin Relvas Martins. But then it opens up into a, a whole landscape of of other um, cases of police violence and and of eyewitness images that are printed on on these blankets. Um, and here you see the kind of entire space. Um, in the background, you see uh the these um patio heaters in in different constellations and in the foreground this is the area that tells more the the, the history of or the, the the story and the story of no negotiating these eyewitness images and um yeah um the images are always um very troubling to to see um also in in this um, form of, of the print. Uh, it's uh, there, are, there are a lot of cases and they um, each of them has has their own story. Um, and the, the stories are also then um, kind of uh, linked in 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 short accounts uh, in in the newspaper that people could take away uh, and and go through further reading that then also contains uh, you know, other moments that traces back to the Watts uprisings um, and the founding of, of the SWAT police, but also um, yeah, the case of, of the Rodney King um, footage that was interpreted by different parties differently. Um, the patio heater, as I mentioned, uh, then also reoccurs in the exhibition, uh, disassembled and taking different shapes and and kind of um, being um, in in assembly with uh, with different um, yeah narratives uh, of of violence uh, footage uh, from the media, but also uh, things from from the archives. There is a material that uh, I took from the southern. California Library uh, from um, from several editions of the Black Panther Community News uh, Service, and that was actually also the the inspiration for making our own newspaper, the the, the newspaper that uh, people could take with them. And um, as you can see, the newspaper has uh, also it has an image um, of you know flames uh, that were taken also from an edition of the Black Panther Community News uh, Service. Um, I guess the, the, the way that, you know, um, that the patio heater is disassembled in, in the exhibition and, and, and reassembled in different ways echoes, you know, um, the, the kind of, um, yeah, uh, the, the various forms in which um, a tool can become a different kind of tool, you know, how uh, how a tool can can migrate from one purpose to another, uh, and and how you can you, you turn a weapon into uh, a vacuum cleaner or the other way around, um, and this is maybe also something that 
that I've been uh, looking at in other projects. Um, and we wanted to um, go also into another project that looks more into uh, or that, that dedicates is more dedicated to sound. And there there's a similar thing happening. Um, I don't know if we have time to go into tribute to whistle, but um, Brian, what do you say? I think we probably have we only have time to go straight to to questions. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's a pity though. It would have been it would have been nice to to hear, but I I don't want yeah. to keep you uh, too far beyond um, beyond our time frame. And we have two uh, very good questions from our students in the program, which maybe. Um, if you don't mind, I will <clears throat> ask them together, also in, in the interest of time. Uh, one uh, one question is 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 uh, is uh, from Kevin Wu, which he admits is a, is a is a selfish inquiry, but it's admirably admirably selfish. Uh, Kevin asks, uh, or he says, he, he thanks you, Natasha and Natasha, for your wonderful presentation. Um, my question is on Natasha Jinwala's earlier remarks on music, poetry, and riot. Could you please elaborate on how uh, sonic disobedience slash haunting or hauntings of other sorts contest and disrupt capitalism's temporality or material reality? And the selfish uh, part is that, is that Kevin's thesis is, is partially on time and the potential of, of hauntology as activism. Um, if, if you don't mind uh, my adding the second, uh, the second question is from, from Sophia Park. And Sophia asks, I'm wondering how you selected the photos of the various riots, rebellions, uprisings that are included in the book or the books. I know photos, at least in the uh, NYC context, um, I'm familiar with but definitely not localized to here can be challenging for activists and participants in terms of personal information uh, protection from surveillance and, and among other reasons. Are the photos treated with a different lens because they come from historical examples? Uh, and thank you for this talk. Please. Okay, um, Kevin, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so the exhibition uh, which came, which came uh, first and then there was the programming um, that built towards the anthology in that I was thinking very much about Mark Fisher and um, the notion of the slow cancellation of the future, which he may not have uh, connected directly to um, to the temporality and the terrain of, of riots and uprisings. But to me, it actually felt very much uh, a charged space in which uh, particularly this incision um, into into the the sort of um, terrain of of time and uh, the terrain of presentness, um, disrupting uh, the kind of uh, continuum of the new cycle, um, uh, keep, uh, maintaining space for trauma. Uh, you know, Fisher, as someone writing on depression, as someone writing on music, in a sense, was very inspiring um, to 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 tackle um, you know this this subject. And not only for me, but also for artists like Allah, Younes, and so forth. I mean, I I think you know there are several examples in in the book um, that came from from all of the editors that actually um, moved towards um, poetry and music. It when I was talking about disrupting um, the spell of capitalism or sort of this rampant neoliberal consumerism, um, it was it was more to to do with the feature of uh, of of riots and mob violence um, that 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 sort of where these the the bodies in space um, whether those are bodies in alliance which is another uh, another scheme or whether it's uh, bodies who willfully choose to to take up space to claim space um, to disrupt overthrow to ruin um, you know to 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 circumscribe and to 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 mark um, also a space of hostility where there has been a continuous uh, making hostile or making outsider uh, to certain kind of subjects. I think I think 
the way that Natasha talk, uses the heater, you know, is this this apparatus is is really interesting because it defines those borders, like she said. And I think um, riots also uh, define certain kinds of borders and presences, and that that's why I was kind of thinking of it in terms of also hauntings. Um, and in say the work of uh, Louis Henderson, which was another example that we spoke about, you know, when he looks at the Bristol city archives, um, he goes to specific, and again, perhaps it is a kind of forensic tactic, you know, but going to the before and after, looking at images from 1980 um, of a bank, you know, that was burned of, of, of streets where there were police uh, in riot shields for the first time in the UK at that point. Um, to then go to those same sites again and see what exists now, what is present now. Um, I think those modes of comparison in his case, again, that became almost like this kind of delirious music video that went back and forth that used uh, that used dub and reggae and the sound system um, as, as this point of echo and return. Um, was was extremely it, it was was again it's it's just it's an artistic strategy but it's one that um creates that space uh, of rupture um and a, a purposeful disjointment um in time space uh, relations so this is probably already too long sorry um but i i hope i hope this is this is good for now i just wanted to also mention um the role of silence um, and maybe this connects to the second question, and then I'll, I'll just sort of pass it on. Um, uh, what we learned through Zina Edwards and Nadine Alanani, um, two extremely uh, incredible um, individuals, uh, Zina is a poet, spoken word artist, who was invited by Galen Elufer, and Nadine Alanani deals with uh, political theory and law. Um, and they, when they talked about Grenfell, you know, and the Grenfell Tower fire, um, it, it was really, um, it was again, just, just really left, I don't know, it, it sort of still think about it because of course now forensic architecture is working on an inquiry into the Grenfell Tower, but the, what Nadine writes about is that when that, when that fire happened, um, the police showed up in riot gear anticipating a riot. You know, so so that again is is again this question of of time, of expectation, of anticipation, and uh, there there was music and there was also silence. Um, Zina talked about silent protests uh, at that point um, of what what it took from the community to not necessarily diffuse uh, the anger or but create another space for mourning, for grieving, for uh, for uh, demands in which there were other other elements, other things happening. Um, and, and just lastly, um, I think with images, I mean, of course, we were very sensitive to what it means to, to you know, use these images that are uh, in the news um, that, but then again, I think our designer did a really brilliant job, Studio Remco van Bladel, um, in using these images in certain kinds of ways uh, between the texts, um, but also at some points, um, you know, using certain kind of uh, visual effects around uh, the images that also deal with kind of blurring, that deal with um, also the the, the sort of um, uh, scarring um, of the page, the marking of the page in different ways. Uh, so there's there is there is a disruption also in the ways that images are, are used. Um, artists design certain pages, you know, to include images that were from their research. Uh, so so there are many strategies that that have gone into. I went into Gari's project in detail of what she did with her photographs in order to bring in points of reflection and open those up beyond. Uh, thinking of them as media images. Um, so, so these are all, I think, different techniques. And um, a duo that I that that I, I've worked with in the past, inhabitants, um, they did this really brilliant uh, uh, short, which is on the Contour Biennale Eight uh, website, where they did this short video called uh, "When Does uh, When Does Video Become Evidence?" I think that that's what it's called. And in that, they're they're actually dealing with, you know, the the cracked uh, sort of phone uh, phone uh, phone surface, like, and 
dealing with uh, the way that the screen is is such a threat the camera phone is such a threat um and 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 why is there a smashing of phone screens you know by the police by um members of 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 different uh, sides in a in a violent situation um and and what does it mean to to also use citizen journalism to use these images to validate um and and to anchor one's presence uh in the public domain yeah maybe just to add to that um i mentioned the case of rodney king and i think just to look at that one case um shows you the complexity of using uh, and and providing footage um, because um, because there's just um, very different uh, ways of of seeing and interpreting uh, the footage and that was what happened in court where um, the defense lawyers of of the police officers um, took out stills uh, from from the video footage and uh, and then managed to uh, convince the jury that what you see in the stills is actually an aggression by Rodney King and not by the police, um, and and I think it's um, it's it's a it's a case that just just shows the very dilemma of of visibility, and um, in this uh, amazing uh, book, uh, reading urban uprising uh, urban uprisings, reading reading Rodney King, um, which we also used a few excerpts of in in the newspaper. Um, maybe I just. Um, read this short quote by, by Judith Butler, who, um, who uh, writes about uh, schematic racism and white paranoia. Um, this is not simply seeing an act of direct perception, but the racial production of the visible, the workings of racial constraints on what it means to see. And I think um, that's the complexity of, of, of the images that we on the one hand produce in order to create this legitimacy crisis for the police. And at the same time, kind of, um, they fall into this battleground of interpretation and, and, and the field of, of, of the visual. Um, and that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's highly complex. On that note, um, I'd like to thank you both for your generosity and, uh, and, and time with us today. Maybe, Thank you um, so much for inviting us. Yeah, um, sometimes I, I, I ask people, you, you can also un unmute yourself if you are comfortable and we can give them a little round of applause, a little mini laptop speaker applause. <laughs>